So last time we um, ended up uh, doing sequencing, but before we uh, showed the sequencer, there was talk about wave shaping and frequency modulation. And in particular, there was a patch that tried to show the equivalence of, of wave shaping and frequency modulation synthesis. And actually, what I'll do is I'll get that patch out just to remind you that it was there. Um, that would have been 217 FM. Here is, this is the fixed up patch with a smaller font size, but you can see that this is uh, making the point that over here there is wave shaping and ring modulation, which was making sounds. Do we have sound? I didn't check sound yet. That was real smart of me. Sound. Carrier frequency. And that, hopefully you're willing to believe, sounds something like what happens when I do frequency modulation, which is this thing where you take an oscillator like this and start changing its frequency but then start changing its frequency fast enough to get this sort of thing. So that is the well-known sound of frequency modulation and this patch was a description of why you could think about frequency modulation as wave shaping and if you want to know what the spectrum of, of frequency modulated sound is. That's to say, if you want to know what the strengths of all the partials are that it can make and what their frequencies are, then you can analyze it by, um, by thinking about what this patch would do. And that leads you into engineering mathematics. You have to know Bessel functions, which I don't want to tell you about right now. So Bessel functions aside, and in fact all of this aside, what I'll do this time is just go back to the basic frequency modulation patch, build it from scratch, and show you what it's good for, uh, just in terms of sound making. And the punchline is going to be that um, it's a thing which combines two oscillators, but of course you can combine 50 oscillators and all sorts of frequency modulating networks where each one modulates the frequency of some other one, and then finally you listen to some oscillator at the bottom. So frequency modulation is this very extensible, very complicatable thing. Um, all right, so I'm going to get rid of this and start from scratch, for just to be nice and pedagogical again. Um, so let's see, we have an output device, and I'm just going to start with oscillator, right? So the oscillator is, let's get a frequency going, which is just a number, hello, number. All right, and then we're going to say that's going to be the frequency. Just to be uh, pedantic, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, make the oscillator out of a cosine, sorry, a phaser, Phaser is the actual oscillator. It's the thing that, that remembers what the phase was previously and gives you the next phase every time the time moves forward, right? Whereas cosine is the thing which is the waveform. It's actually done internally with a table lookup, so you can think of this as being generalizable by table lookup kinds of objects. But anyway, here is an oscillator divided up into the oscillator part and the wavetable part, and it sounds like it always used to sound and this is a good check to make sure our computer is still working. Okay, 440. All right. Okay, now we're going to take this and we're going to start messing with its frequency. And again, just to be as pedagogical and as didactic as I possibly can, I'm going to do this in two different ways and make, uh, make a claim about how they can be thought of as equivalent if you ignore a couple of minor problems. So the first thing is we're going to take this and we're going to take a... S oh, you know what? Before I do that, even before I duplicate it, um, of course, anytime you have an oscillator, you're likely to want to control its amplitude, and I'm going to want to control the amplitudes of all these oscillators. So we're going to get a multiplier and a line tilde. Line tilde because I want to make everything sound nice. And, and the line tilde is going to get messages. I'm thinking back up the tree now. So the messages are going to be packed. You know, some, some value, some amount of time that I'm going to make the, the line tilde ramp at. And that's going to now be a control, which I control with a number box. Duplicate. Get this number box over here. 
So now what we have, sorry, this is all very repetitious, but now what we have is the 440 hertz tone. Um, I can listen to it at my favorite listening level, but I can also turn it on and off that way. All right. Okay, now we have an amplitude controlled oscillator. Now I'm going to make frequency modulation out of it in two different ways. So the first way is going to be by doing the real frequency modulation thing, which is to say, I'll take this oscillator, but the input of the oscillator is going to be another oscillator. So it's going to be something plus 440. So I need to now to have an adder. And, and what I'm going to add to it is going to be a whole other oscillator. So I'm going to take this oscillator and make it nice and compact because we're going to be, we're going to have several of these up on the screen very soon, unfortunately. Okay, so let's get another one of these puppies. Put it up here. Uh, didn't mean to do that scrolling thing. Let's, and now this one is going to be added to the frequency of the other oscillator, right? So, sorry, this is boring. So now we're going to say this one is going to talk to us and we control its amplitude. Oh, yeah, we need this 440. It's not in the plus yet. And now this oscillator, and I forgot, of course, to make a nice number box to set its frequency. This is the modulating oscillator, which now can get a frequency and an amplitude. And now, I don't know if that's audible, but that's now making vibrato, or with different parameters, it's making frequency modulation. Okay? So that's a thing. The, and now you can think of this as being two different oscillators. Uh, in fact, I'm going to put this close to this oscillator so that you can see them as being essentially the same thing. This could have been plus 120, but I'm just, you know, I'm not going to be that didactic, right? So this oscillator now, if you think of it as an oscillator, it, it has a constant and a variable part uh, to its frequency, and it has a thing for controlling its amplitude, and then it multiplies, and then that's it, right? Now, um, what I'm going to do, oh yes, before I forget, I have to tell you one other bit of PD lore that I probably haven't said before, which is, um, it would be natural to try to do this. We'll take this thing and disconnect it and just run the signal and the message into the phaser expecting PD to add these things automatically. This will fatally confuse, well not fatally, this will badly confuse PD because PD is seeing messages here and it's seeing a signal here and the phaser has to decide whether this inlet is a signal inlet or a message inlet. And what it will do in this case is it will actually decide, gee, I'm a signal inlet because there's a signal connected to me. And these messages are superfluous, right? Uh, if these messages were not superfluous, that's to say if it just remembered these messages, then you could get in some awfully bad problems because someone could send a number five into this phaser and you could forget it and have this phaser around with a number five and hook stuff into it and wonder why everything was five hertz off. So, so instead of allowing that to happen, uh, when you have a signal and a uh, message connection to the same thing, the message connections are simply ignored. So now we have the rather embarrassing fact that this thing is now playing at 576 hertz if I do this. But if I connect this to it, it forgets the 576 hertz because that got overridden by the incoming signal. So signals override messages, and that is why if you want these two things to add, it's not okay just to, or it won't work just to put them in the same inlet as if they were both signals. If they're both signals, they'll be added for you automatically, but if one of them is a signal and the other is control, PD will not know what to do, and so you have to add explicitly, like that, which is how I had it before, okay? All right, so that's a detail about PD that can very easily be confusing, so I want it to be very over cautious about that. Now, uh, the whole point of this exercise is to take this and show you how to do it another way. And the reason for this is because the other way is the way it's actually done in practice, which is you take this oscillator, all right, but instead of having it be an oscillator with an extra input 
for frequency, you make it be an oscillator with an extra input for phase. And what that means is you have your phaser first, which is making phase, but meanwhile you can add your own phase to it. Actually, it's going to be better to work it this way. So now what we have is, oh, I'm going to make this, huh, it seems unavoidable to add an extra object and make the oscillator uglier, but I guess that's just what it is. So now what we have is an oscillator with two inputs again, well one of them is just a number box, but this is now controlling the amplitude and this is controlling the frequency, all right, and in fact if I just tell this 440 and this something reasonable, I should hear the sound again, good, but now the addition is not being added to the frequency but it is being added to the phase which is the stuff that's between the phaser and the cosine and this is the point to splitting the oscillator up into a phaser and a cosine ten minutes ago which was that I wanted to be able to get in there and add something in between the phaser and the cosine which OSC tilde doesn't have an inlet to do and therefore I have to rewrite it in this more elementary form or in terms of these more elementary objects. Okay. Now, so this is a, an oscillator with a frequency control signal input. This is an oscillator with a phase control frequency input. And again, I can just do all the same stuff. So th this, this up here is an oscillator without any controls at all. It's just being an oscillator. And now I can do this. And let's see, just to try to get equivalent results, uh, let's turn this on. Let's see. So now we hear that one. You know what? I'm going to be a little louder. Okay. Oscillator. And now I'll make this one be, do the same thing. 0 0.3. Oscillator. Oops, sorry. Left this on. Now let's turn that off. And we have the same thing. Now, we can make vibrato out of either of these two oscillators. This one, it's obvious how to do it. We'll take this thing and make it go six times per second five times per second. Oh, sorry, five times per second is the right one. And then there's a depth here. And for instance, just just so that we can, well, let's see. All right, let's just do it by ear. So we'll do 10 hertz, which is a, ew, no, five hertz vibrato. Okay, not a totally unreasonable setting. Let's do that over here. Okay, now can you make vibrato by adding a sinusoid to the phase of the thing instead of adding a sinusoid to the frequency? The answer is, unless, unless the answer changes, the answer is you can do exactly the same thing because, all right, what a phaser really does is integrate the input over time. What that means is that I'm putting signals in here and if I put a, for instance, a constant signal in like 440, what the phaser does is it fixes it so that its slope is proportional to 440 hertz. Or to put it another way, what the phaser does really is every point it simply adds its phase, it adds to its previous output, which is its phase, a, an, an increment, a phase increment, which is proportional to the frequency. So what it's doing is it's adding in values of the frequency sample by sample, accumulating them. And of course there's a little detail that when it hits one, it racks back around to zero, and that's really for numerical accuracy more than any other thing. If you had infinite numerical accuracy, the phaser could simply be a straight line going off to infinity. So if a phaser is an integrator, integration is linear, so we're integrating 440 and that gives us a nice ramp, but we also can integrate a sinusoid and the integral of a sinusoid, as you all learned in calculus, is another sinusoid. So the integral the indefinite integral of the cosine function is sine, and the indefinite integral of sine is minus cosine. So either way, it, integration just changes the phase and actually the amplitude. Oh, why? Because depending on the frequency, the, there will be a different constant in there when you do the integration or, or differentiation. Okay, that's calculus. I'm not supposed to use calculus here, so let's. Why don't you forget I just said that? Okay. So at any rate, what that is saying is that if I am adding if I want to simulate adding a cosine to the frequency of an oscillator, I could do it by adding a 
cosine of a different phase and amplitude to the phase of the oscillator. In other words, I could add the thing here, or I could add its incremental sum here. And, well, in fact, if you don't believe it, I'll play it for you, and then you'll have to believe it. So now I'll make this thing be 5 hertz. It'll be the same frequency, but I'll have to give it a different value here. I don't know what it's going to be yet, uh, but it's going to be much smaller. Uh -huh, like that. So now I claim this signal is, what's the right word, is similar to this signal. Whoops, give me that signal. Okay, in fact, we can even make them be the same by ear. Now, this one had to have an amplitude of 5 because, okay, we're going to range from 440 plus 5 hertz down to 440 minus 5 hertz. This one had to have a much smaller amplitude because all we had to change this phase by was how much that 5 hertz could get you in, oh, I have two numbers, 5, in the one-fifth of a second it takes this oscillator to cycle. That's hand-waving. But, in fact, this has to be on the order of, um, uh, on the order of a fifth as big as this because this frequency is 5. Um, it's actually, this number is actually going to be 5 over 2 pi. And now, is it really true that 1 over 2 pi is about 0.13? Now, we have to find this out, because otherwise, we won't ever know. Alright, free open source mathematics package. 0.159, 0 0.16 roughly. So this number I claim, this number here is this number divided by 5 because the faster this thing goes, the less it accumulates. So the faster this is going, the more you have to divide by. I'm, be, I'm arguing by proportion and not by, not by actual equations, right? So what we, what we have over here is going to be inversely proportional to the frequency proportional to this number because it's we're trying to get the same sound and I'm just going to tell you that the factor that you have to throw in is 2 pi which you will get out of calculus class if you get go there All right so to try to see if this still holds I'll try some other number here Ooh. I'm sorry yeah that's a this is a frequency now 30 and now I'll choose some horrendous value here now I'll see if I can get that same sound over here and see if it's still true. Okay, so we're going to go 30. And then, oh my, that was too easy. Is that the same sound? Ah. No. It has to go up higher. All right, does that sound similar? Maybe. So let's take this thing and divide it by 30 and divide it by 2 pi and see if we get that, right? 70 divided by 30 divided by my 2 pi. 0 0.37, 0 0.38. Ears are wonderful things. Your ears can do better mathematics than your eyes. Oh, yeah, that's actually true. I don't know how accurate your eyes are for, for seeing things spatially or seeing colors or, or seeing frequencies, but your ear can hear three cents difference in frequency, which, let's see, three cents is a thirtieth of an octave and you have roughly a tenth oct ten octave range of hearing. So that's a part in three thousand. That's the most accurate sense of, that you have in your body. <laughs> that's not bad. Okay. Oh, and it's fast too. It's faster than vision. Anyway. Let's go back to where we are here. So what I'm claiming, although I'm just giving this to your ears, I'm not doing the mathematics out, is that we can change the frequency or we can change the phase, and as long as it is true that the, uh, that the thing that we're modulating by happens to be a sinusoid, why does that have to be a sinusoid for this to be true? Because I made this hand-waving argument about 
you have to put the integral of this thing in here to get the same effect. In other words, whatever you have here, you have to accumulate it here. And it turns out that if you accumulate a sinusoid just by adding up values cumulatively, you'll get another sinusoid. And that's a wonderful property of sinusoids that, in this case, makes it possible for us to rearrange this thing from this form to this form. And, but that only works for sinusoids. It does not work for other waveforms. For other waveforms, it turns out that this is a better thing to compute than this. And I don't know how to explain why very well. But this is more likely to give you what you want than this. Yeah, I'm not going to try to explain that. <laughs> if the integral of this thing, if... Mm, too complicated to get into. All right. Anyway, here's another good thing about this form. Oh, I've probably already let the cat out of the bag. This is the, this is the way it's always done in hardware. Okay, why? For the very simple reason, not the very simple reason, for the unobvious reason and the very interesting reason that good values of amplitude of oscillators that you use to modulate are the same, in the same range as good values for listening to stuff. In other words, if you take these numbers well, okay, these numbers that you have to choose in order to make this thing sound right are much larger than these numbers that you have to choose to make this thing sound right. The amplitudes have to be down here, but the widths of frequency deviation have to be, well, they have to be on the order of the frequency itself to have a reasonable effect, which is again saying why you had to divide this thing by this thing to get how strong an effect it is. Here, the proportionality to the frequency is already built in, or rather, well, yeah, so, for instance, here, what I could say is that this is the same thing as deviating this thing not by 30, not by 0.38 hertz. This is deviating this frequency by 70 hertz. This is going from 440 plus 70 down to 440 minus 70. This one is going from 440 to what? Well, we heard the same thing. So, in fact, it's going approximately from 440 plus 70 to 440 minus 70. But... This is a better way of saying it. It's going 440 plus or minus 0.38, 38% of itself divided by 2 pi. So forget, forgetting the 2 pi because 2 pi is close to 1. Uh, this is the proportional depth of frequency modulation, whereas this is the absolute depth, and the proportional depth is a better unit to be talking about frequency modulation in. All right. <laughs> stony dead silence. <laughs> exactly what we want. Every professor wants stony dead silence when they talk. <laughs> okay. Now, what we're going now with that as as an excuse, now I can actually take the entire left-hand side of the patch and erase it and do something else instead, which is to take the right-hand side of the patch and populate it with other stuff. Um before I do that, I'm going to do something else, which is this. Uh, I'm going to show you the spectrum of this again. This is going to be another proof that these things are sort of similar. Um, in fact, this is going to be a test of whether our ears or our eyes are better at, at, at uh, finding the similarity. So what I'm going to do is go sort of do a little deus ex machina again. Uh, this is a... Whoops, sorry. Got to go back to... Ignore the fact that you saw the future in that open dialogue. <laughs> All right, livespectrum.pd. Here we are. Okay, this is a nice patch which I developed for totally different reasons and which I do not want to explain. But this patch, which you can get if you download the patches for today, lets you do the good stuff like, hi, I am a spectrum and not... Oh, here we go, ADC. Here is now... Okay, I will not dwell on this because this will get, uh, I will end up talking for hours about the wonderful properties of spectra of voices. But what you see here, oh, I'm going to, anyhow, I'm going to not be able to stop myself from doing this. Where's the control? Duh. Okay, there is a spectrum 
Um, this is like the spectral analyzer I had out for talking about wave shaping a couple of sessions ago, but this is a real one which doesn't care that I use exactly frequencies which are uh, aligned to the filter bank that I used to measure the spectrum. Never mind what all that was. This is a general spectrum estimator which, uh, in which peaks just look like peaks that can move up and down continuously without getting messed up. Okay. Uh, all right, good enough. And I stopped it now, but what's really happening is that every, I don't know what, every 20th of a second this thing is making a new nice picture and, and showing us a new spectrum. Okay. Now, the reason I hauled this out was not so that you, um, not to, not to show off my voice, the spectrum of my voice so much as it is to show off the spectrum of frequency modulation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this patch and use a wonderful feature of PD, which is that you can send and receive signals from one patch to another to make it talk to this patch, or actually listen to this patch. Send spectrograph. And I'm doing this so that we can look at the spectrum. Woohoo! What did it tell me I did wrong? Graph to, oh, I don't care about that. All right, we don't care about any of that stuff. Uh, okay, so now here's the wonderful frequency modulating sound that I just made. And here is its spectrum, if I can find that window again. Ta-da. Well, okay. This, the choice of frequencies I made was good for our ears to be able to find the uh, same bunch of junk, but it's not so great for looking at. So I'll, I'll, go, change the, um, I'll go change the parameters later and show you how this is all affected. What I'm going to do now is um, check that this spectrum that we're looking at right now is actually kind of the same thing in these two windows. Oh, sorry, in these two uh, techniques of doing frequency modulation. So there's the one, and here is the other. So remember what this graph looks like. And now we do this one, and we get approximately the same thing. Okay, so that's another non-proof, another, uh, uh, what's the right word? Another sort of demonstration without proof that, in fact, what we're doing here is in some sense equivalent to what we're doing here. You heard it, and now you see it in some sense. All right, now I'm going to get rid of this, and we're just going to be looking at spectra of frequency modulation networks. And I'm making room because this is going to grow, as always. Right? Stuff never shrinks. Save. Uh, OK, so now we're listening to this, and we're looking at the spectrum. And, okay, so now, um, as we remember, as if we turn this uh, down to, say, zero, we are looking at a sinusoid, which looks like a peak in, in frequency land. And now as we, let's see, let me put, that's ah, all right. Okay, I'll turn this back on. And, okay, so one thing you see is that the thing is getting fatter and fatter and fatter the bigger I push the deviations in frequency. All right. Now, the other thing um, that we actually sort of already know is that, let's, let's get a bigger frequency, like 100, so we can see it. The spacing of the peaks that we have here is set by the modulating frequency. Okay, so terminology. I've been a little sloppy about not being, not defining my terms as I use them, which is unfortunately normal for me. Uh, so this is this is an oscillator. This, in common speech, is called the carrier oscillator, and this oscillator is called the modulating oscillator. And I think, although I can't swear to this, that this goes back to the days of radio, where where FM was a way that you got signals from from a radio station to a radio receiver, and this signal, the carrier signal, would be the whatever it would be, 92.5, right? 
uh, whatever radio station you listen to, you, you dial in the carrier frequency, and this modulating frequency would be the frequency or frequencies that would be present in the signal that you're listening to on the radio. Okay, so that's why the, so that's why this is called the modulating frequency. And now we're uh, okay. And so this your radio your FM radio doesn't sound like this when when the announcer is silent only because this frequency is um, 92 megahertz. Say it's it's too high to hear. These frequencies would be audio. In this case, they're both audio. They're both in the audio range, 20 to 20k. And again, as we change the strength of the modulating oscillator, what we see is that the spectrum that we started with grows, uh, grows limbs. And furthermore, what we see is that those limbs don't move around. That's to say they don't shift left or right. They stay in the same place but they change amplitude. Oh yeah, negative does something similar to positive, as usual. And where are these things? Well, everyone knows, but I'll tell you anyway. So, so this, this number, this frequency here is 440, and these are 440 plus and minus 100, plus and minus 200, and so on, or to put it another way, all these peaks are separated by 100 hertz from each other. And the other thing about that is that if one of those things lands negative, an oscillator oscillating at a negative frequency is the same thing as an oscillator possibly with a different phase oscillating at a positive frequency because we can only hear the real part of these things. And so if I push the this amplitude so that this so that peaks further and further out from the center get energy, at, at a certain point I'll start to see funny stuff in the low frequencies because the peaks will start That's the right word. New peaks will start appearing. Yeah, you can't see it with these choices of frequencies. Okay, sorry, I'm going to now increase all these frequencies. Let's go up to E, and this will be 200 hertz. Try it again. Yeah, so now you see there's the carrier frequency. Here is side bands, which are that's I don't know what I don't know why they're called sidebands, but these are these are, are peaks which describe frequencies that are present in the signal that are 660 plus and minus 200 hertz. So this is 460, 660 minus 200. This is 260. This is 60. And furthermore, there's going to be one that is minus 140, which is 60 minus 200. And minus 140 is the same thing as positive 140 if it's the frequency of an oscillator. So you see there's a peak trying to grow here, and that peak is 140 hertz. And furthermore, I can put more and more energy into it. And it's not just that we're going to get energy at 140, but we'll get energy at 340 and 540. Those are actually minus, well, morally speaking, these are minus 140, minus 340 and minus 540 hertz, but we see them as positive. Okay, so the amplitudes depend on on this amplitude here, and the frequencies are all fixed forever, immutable. All right. Now, uh, one other piece of terminology before I forget to say it, which is that these things all have names. So this is the this is the carrier oscillator. So this is the carrier frequency. This is the modulating oscillator, so this is the modulation frequency. This is the amplitude of the modulating oscillator, which is also known as the index of modulation. And that word index is uh, people who were talking about wave shaping back in the 70s stole the word index, I think, from FM and started using it to describe wave shaping. So in a wave shaping setup where you have oscillator multiplier and nonlinear table lookup, that multiplier there is, uh, could also be called the index of wave shaping. So, the, so index sort of means uh, either the amplitude of an oscillator before you do something nonlinear to it like this or like wave shaping, uh, or it could mean how much you're messing the sound up by doing something nonlinear to it, which is the same thing as what, by what amplitude you throw it through this nonlinear thing. Sort of. I'm 
coasting over details there. All right. So and yeah, okay. So what does it sound like? Uh, the original tone, and then you get this kind of stuff. You can get all the sorry. You can get all the partials you want. Um, Notice the the, uh, the sort of, what's the right word, the sort of characteristic pattern of frequency modulation, which is that af a after a certain point, the partials start appearing in pairs because uh, negative frequency and positive frequencies uh, ones are both going in an arithmetic sequence with the same separation. So you should get this sort of, um, um, I don't know, one, two, one, two, one, two kind of pattern. Uh, the other thing about it is the amplitudes of these things. Um, First, yeah, okay, let me drop the frequency again. So I, I made the modulation frequency large then to, to show you all about reflection about zero, which happens in frequency, right? But the other thing to, to wonder about is how do the amplitudes op act, um, you know, okay, they're Bessel functions, you've all heard that, but uh, how do they act, um, um, sorry, word, empirically? And the answer is sort of, Okay, first off, the thing gets fatter and fatter as you push up the index of modulation, which is the amplitude of the modulation oscillator. The energy starts in the, uh, at the center frequency and it goes out, so the, the signal picks up bandwidth. And the FCC gets very excited about that because, of course, if you have two radio stations, the bandwidth, of, the sum of their bandwidths ought not to be more than the distance between the two frequencies or else they'll be cross-talking. Okay. So now, um, now uh, talking about amplitudes then, yes, the amplitudes arrange themselves so that more and more energy appears further and further out from the center frequency, but without these frequencies changing, it's just that the amplitudes are changing in such a way to make the frequency appear to be spreading, right? Okay, and the other thing is that, okay, to start with you get nice, normal, reasonable stuff like this. And it even sounds reasonable. Well, let's see. Reasonable, I'm not sure, but... Nah, it sounds horrible, but that's because I chose bad frequencies for the nice picture, right? Okay, so uh, the other uh, sort of odd thing that starts happening is that as you push the frequency harder, the center, fre the carrier frequency, the center peak, which is the peak at the carrier frequency, loses energy. It, it, it looks like it's actually giving energy off to its sidebands, which sort of pretend is happening. These are sidebands, right? Uh, but it actually ends up giving all of its energy off into the sidebands. So as we push the index further, we actually lose the center frequency altogether. That happens at an index of eh, about you know, 0.38. I don't actually know what that number is. I tried to figure it out once, but I, I think it's just a number. Okay, there's a number which you just don't have any fundamental, uh, sorry, you don't have any carrier frequency left at all but you have nothing but sidebands. And furthermore, if you push it further, that frequency, uh, sorry, that amplitude, which was going down, keeps going down and, and goes negative. But of course, negative amplitudes are the same thing as positive amplitudes. Meanwhile, by the way, okay, so we're going back to zero. So, so the evolution of the amplitude of the first one is it went, it goes from large to zero to negative to zero to up to zero to down and so on like that. Meanwhile, watch this partial. Actually, these two will have the same amplitude, so watch either one of them. And they start from zero, zero, and they grow, and they start getting, you know, going up. That's all right. But at a certain point, they hit their maximum and start dropping too. And furthermore, they will eventually go through zero as well. And furthermore, the next ones will go through zero as well, and so on like that, so that you actually even have a sort of a wave, or even a sequence of waves of energy going out from the frequency of the original fundamental. So this is the, sorry, this is the original carrier frequency. Now we have sort of one lump here and another lump there. And if we start pushing the modulation index, index of modulation up higher, you'll see more and more of these waves and you'll hear these partials appearing and disappearing in amplitude. And that gives you a characteristic uh, sound that you could sort of describe as a rolling sound. Which, you know, 
you could think that sounds cool or you could just sort of think that that sounds like the bad side of FM depending on your uh, depending on uh, what kinds of sounds you like um, but I will say that if you listen to John Chowning's music uh, which is worth doing John Chowning being the person who invented frequency modulation as a synthesis technique for music um, you'll find that his indices that, well going to tell you a lot. You'll find that at the beginning of his first piece, the indices of modulation are all very nice and small. But then he sort of starts feeling his oats and the indices start going up. So never mind I said that. Anyhow, these are these are the nice sort of classical sounds that have nice, you know, sort of smooth spectra that just sort of have a peak. Um, and then you can get the funny sounds that just are complicated and, and you know, fraught, full of full of energy all over the place, which sound like this. Okay, so all right now, okay, so that's so the sort of easy way of describing it, of describing what's going on is this sets the center of the energy. This is the carrier frequency, which says where the energy is going to be centered. This says where, uh, this talks about the bandwidth, the amount, the, the, the extent to which the energy is spread out over other partials besides the carrier frequency. And this is the spacing of the partials. And of course now, um, good things happen when you ask for the carrier frequency, say, yeah, 220, and the modulating frequency to be What's the right word? Ooh, bad choice to start with. To be mu multiples of each other. Now we've set up a situation where the carrier frequency and the modulating frequency are the same. And so to start with, we have this. And now as we push the index up, the first sideband over here is going to be DC, zero frequency, and we won't hear it. The next one will be twice the fundamental, which will be up here. And in fact, no matter how often you multiply and subtract, sorry, add and subtract integer multiples of 220 to 220, you get another integer multiple of 220. Gee, and so what we have here, no matter what, is going to be, is going to be periodic, and its, and its period is going to be consistent with a frequency of 220. That's to say its period will be 1 220th of a second. And this, is the sound that in 1973 sounded to those computer musicians like a trumpet. So if you say, make a computer music trumpet, that's the sound. Now, how do you make the computer music clarinet? Oh, well, you just make this one be 440 like I did to start with. And now, oh, uh, and now the first peak is 220, but then you get 220 plus 440, which is, oh, 660. 220 minus 440? is minus 220. So this, so the reflection of this peak lands right where it was. And furthermore, every multiple, that's say every 220 plus or minus any integer times 440 is 220 or 660 or whatever that number is, 5 times 220, 11, 1,100 and so on like that. And so now we have a sound that has only odd harmonics. And that ladies and gentlemen, is the computer music clarinet from 1973. All right, so got your trumpet, 220, or actually the, okay, the trumpet is carrier, sorry, modulating frequency equals carrier frequency, and the clarinet is, yeah, modulating frequency is twice carrier frequency. Okay, you could do other, oh, yeah, okay, here's another thing about that. Uh, I set the center frequency sorry, the carrier frequency to be 220. And then we saw that all the possible peaks that could arise in the sidebands would be odd multiples of 220, odd number multiples of 220. But that would also be true if this number were 660 or 1100. All I'm doing is I'm taking the carrier frequency and I'm placing it either here or here or here or here. And the result is always the, the same collection of possible harmonics. What am I doing? 
the timbre changes. What's the next one? One. Got to add 440. 1540. Right? Oops, no. Oh, sorry. No, that was right to start with. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm moving the carrier frequency to occupy different peaks in this spectrum, but the spacing is always given as 440, and so the spectrum itself stays the same. And in general, this is true, that actually no matter what this number is, uh, or no matter what these two numbers are, you could then add this number into that one or subtract it from it, and you would get different amplitudes, but you would get the same frequencies of the partials present. So now, for instance, and maybe this is kind of obvious, you can play additive synthesis games with frequency modulation by, by choosing carrier frequencies which are multiples of a desire, or which, are, which are chosen to be lying on a desired spectrum. The spectrum, though, of course, has to be a spectrum that you can get from FM in the first place. Then you can throw F voices of FM along any of these possible center frequencies and add them and you will get more complicated FM instruments that still obey that same spacing of frequency. And there are two simple ones that work well. This is the odd harmonic one, and then there's the sort of normal one where you... Ooh, sorry. Normal one. The trumpet one, as I called it. Okay, so, the, so now the carrier and modulator frequencies are the same, but again, now I can take the frequency of the modulating oscillator and add it to the carrier oscillator any number of times and I get these kinds of sounds notice okay the fundamental is the same it's 220 but there are twice as many peaks in the spectrum the other peak on the, the other spectrum only had the odd peaks and this one now has all the all the integer multiples of 220 right? And, and also enjoy how the, since I chose a reasonable index of modulation that's below that wonderful number, 0.37 something, uh, the peak is always going to lie where I put the uh, carrier oscillator. Yeah, not really, but sort of. Uh, the peak is sort of here. Try another one. Yeah, maybe we'll drop this back a little further for that really to be true. Oh, right, sorry. 30, 0.37 is where this peak actually disappeared, but there's also some point at which this peak quits being the, ta the tallest. And I don't know where that is. That's some smaller number. Okay, so now we have 220, 440, 660, and now you can see that you can make spectra that, var that variously have, their, uh, have the energy centered in different places, and you can superpose them. What about the phases? The story about phases is ugly, and you should look in the book if you want to find out how the phases operate. But the, sort, the short answer is, if you work it out so that the phases below the, the uh, carrier frequency are all in phase, are all, are all like cosine, then the ones up on the other side are like cosine too, except that they are alternating in sine. And I don't know a good, simple explanation for why such a thing would happen. So phase is a mess. Um, just try not to think about phase. Pretend it's on your side or something. And, and if you do care about phase, don't do frequency modulation, but do something that has a simpler spectrum than this. So, right, so the, so the complexity of the spectrum here comes from two things. One is that uh, you get this sort of rolling effect as the index of modulation goes up, that sort of chaotic in and out of, of various frequencies. And the other thing that is odd about it is you don't see it, but the phases of these things are not terribly well behaved. The good thing is that the amplitude of what comes out is really, really well behaved because it's just, no matter what you do to the frequency or phase of this oscillator, you can modulate this oscillator until kingdom come, it's never going to get outside of the range from minus 0.3 to positive 0.3. And so it's going to be good to your Fender Dual Showman amp, right? in a way that some other algorithms that were chosen to have phase coherence here might not do for you. And there the example would be the phase-aligned formant synthesis technique, which is described in chapter 6, which, um, which shows you how to make these spectra with very nicely controllable uh, amplitudes and phases of partials, but which has another Achilles heel, which is that it gets very spiky and very bad for amplifiers. 
I don't know any way of getting both good amplitude and phase behavior and getting a signal whose behavior just in terms of what it ranges from and, and what percentage of the time it's actually giving you good energy are both controllable uh, simultaneously. I don't know how you do that. All right. Now, next thing about this, um, picture, picturing yourself at Stanford University back in 73, uh, this only cost us two oscillators. That's to say it only took Chowning an hour of computation to hear about five seconds of two operator FM back in the day on his Foonly F4 computer, if I remember correctly. So why don't we make the thing take an hour and a half to get our five seconds of sound and add another oscillator? Where are we going to add it? Well, let's add it. Okay, well, we know what would happen if we added one down here. Well, we can figure out what would happen pretty quickly if we added one down here. Okay, so I'm going to need an adder now. So I'm going to put these puppies down here. And then I'm... Ew, that was kind of wrong. And then I'm going to just add them. Because I might be adding other stuff in too. So here's the thing. Okay, we're going to look at it too. Good. Okay. So if I had another one of these things with another you know, with other stuff, with other parameters. But I'll, I'll, I'll reuse the modulating oscillator and just give myself two carrier oscillators and add them. What then would happen? Well, we know what spectrum this thing is going to make, or at least we know how to talk about what kind of spectrum this thing makes. Right. And this one is just another one of the same thing. So it does the same thing too, right? And so now we just superpose the two spectra and now we have more control over the timbre of the sound. Now for, oh, the light. <laughs> The wonderful motion-controlled light either concluded that we're not moving enough or that we're moving too much. We will never know. <laughs> right. Okay, so what happened there was, well, I mean, maybe this is just too obvious for words, but I'm, I'm reusing this signal, but in fact I would have gotten the same thing if I'd had this, if I'd had two of these oscillators with the same parameters, more or less. But what's happening here is I'm just adding, I'm just using two carrier oscillators and what's coming out is just the sum of what would have happened if I'd done the two carrier oscillators separately and that's kind of obvious now that you look at it, right? Um, except that if I were one of those crazy people who liked to do frequency modulation with waveforms that weren't uh, sinusoids, they weren't pure sinusoids, uh, one way that I could think about what that would be doing is I could think of that of the non-sinusoidal waveform as being a sum of sinusoids of different frequencies. And then you could think of the oscillator itself as being a, an additive synthesis, an equivalent additive synthesis patch that might have an infinitude of oscillators being added into it. But anyway, it's, you could simulate any waveform you want with additive synthesis. So I'm not going to prove that right now. And so this would be a good description of what happens when you have uh, a non-sinusoidal waveform um, as a carrier oscillator which, by the way, the FCC will not be happy about. But that's all right. We're not, uh, we're not radiating too much uh, here other than acoustically. All right, so, so, there, so that is taking... So that's adding another modulating... Os sorry, that's adding another carrier oscillator. Now, what we can think about is... Oh, and terminology. Uh, by the time you do this, then you're starting to get the idea that, oh, these oscillators with these controllable phases are building blocks in a sense. And for some reason, Yamaha Corporation got to calling these things operators. So this is 3 operator FM. And of course, 3 operator FM, you could invent other topologies. In fact, I'll show you another couple uh, that would also be 3 operator FM. Um, the famous DX7 synthesizer that made 
that was, you know, FM for the masses for the first time was six operator FM. So imagine all the good, cool things you could do with six of these, piling them together in different ways. And the thing that made that all possible was the fact that it was phase modulation as opposed to frequency modulation so that the units that you described the amplitudes in were all compatible. In other words, you didn't have to go choosing crazy uh, different ranges of numbers for different oscillators. And so you could manage them very easily even in old-fashioned 1980s architectures, 70s even. Okay, so go back and see. So now, uh, so that was putting the oscillator there, the extra oscillator. I could take this uh, operator if you want. I could take the extra operator and put it up here. We still have three operator FM. But now what we have is the two other oscillators. Let's see how I'm going to get it to where we can see all this. There's not much hope anymore. Well, all right, so I can make this thing take less vertical space. No, we're just not going to be able to do very well. Okay, so now, let, okay, so let me turn one of these things off and let's see what we get. Okay, so, so here now what I'm going to do, okay, what I've got is, okay, the carrier frequency is 440 and I'm going to choose two modulating frequencies, 220, and here I'm going to choose a, a different one. Well, that's a good choice. Uh, 550. All right, so now, okay, now both of these oscillators are turned off in the sense that their amplitudes are zero, okay? And now this, uh, so now we just hear the carrier frequency, and now we know what this oscillator will do to it. Whoa, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot the shift key. There. Okay, that's two operator FM. Here's what the other one does. The other one is 550. So, oh, I'm going to make it 550, sorry. And then it does this. Hmm, isn't that sweet? Maybe it's sweet, maybe not, depending on how you feel about it. Okay, so just to be painfully uh, slow about this, there's 440. There's 440 minus 550, which is plus 110. And then this is 440 plus 550, which is 990. This is this one plus 550, so it's 660. So we got 110, 440, 660, 990, and so on. It's uh, 1, 4, 6, 9, 11, and so on, times a fundamental frequency of 110. That's kind of cool. And it sounds like this. All right. And now, how do you think about what happens when you do both of these together? Well, it turns out to be strikingly easy. Let's do it this way. Let's start with the, with the 550. Okay. Now, I told you before that you could think of Let's see. Okay, so if someone gave you a two operator FM network that was a sinusoid modulating, but it was a carrier that had a complex waveform, you could think of that as a as a as a sum of simpler two operator FM modules where the modulator was always a sinusoid and the carrier was always a sinusoid, because those imaginary carriers you would just arrange them to add up to the complex waveform. This thing you can think of and analyze in exactly the same way because you can combine these two. These are the ones we're listening to right now. You can think of this thing, whatever it is, it's, it's periodic with 110 hertz, period. And so it itself is a thing that at least in your mind you could, use, you could describe as a sum of sinusoidal oscillators. And here are the frequencies that they're at. Right? And we could even, if you wanted to, uh, write down a bad formula for what their amplitudes were. And now when we start taking this complex waveform and modulating it with this sinusoid, what will happen is that it will act like each of these peaks was independently getting modulated. And then we will get this extraordinarily complicated thing 
which is each of these peaks sprouting its own side bands. And of course the side bands are all mixed up in each other because this, the first two side bands of this peak are here and here, but the first two side bands of this peak are here, and I'm not sure where to say the other one is probably he maybe here again. Not sure. And so now we get all of the frequencies which are, oh, yeah, okay, so to go back. Now what we have is, this is two operator, if I turn this one off, so now it's just these two, right? So it's 440 plus or minus integer multiples of 550. Now each one of those you can think of as being the carrier frequencies for a new two operator FM setup. And that, and whatever these frequencies are, like this 440 again will spout 440 plus or minus integer multiples of this. So in sum, what you get out of the whole thing is 440 plus or minus any integer times this plus or minus any integer times that. Which is potentially a very nice thick spectrum. Oops, sorry. So, so we have that sound and now we add this in and we get this kind of stuff. And now, it's idiot's delight. We can, we have basically all the spectra that we can possibly wish for and the only thing that we could wish for that we don't have is some way of actually getting from one desired spectrum to another in a continuous and um, ergonomic way, or thinkable way, understandable way, comprehensible way, right? So you throw numbers in here and you get spectra, and you can say where the frequencies are, and that's all right, but someone tells you, I got the spectrum, can you make FM do it for me? And then you just sort of say, hmm. Uh, and there are papers out about that, because People in the early 70s got really excited about that. Oh, FM, that's this very powerful synthesis technique. Let's take the sound of this real trumpet, analyze it, and then figure out how we're going to stuff parameters into these FM networks to sound like a real trumpet that was analyzed. And the answer is you can, you can get this waveform and you can get that, well, not even, but you can imitate, you can get a sort of a bad imitation of, or a vague imitation of one set of partial strengths and of another. And then you can, uh, and then you can try to get continuously from the one to the other, but then you will find that the parameters that you had to do for this aren't actually in the neighborhood of the parameters that you had to get for that. They're somewhere else in some mountain range of horrible parameter choices. And as a result, you can't actually make continuous paths that get between spectra in any desirable way that you could wish, as a general rule. So FM turns out to not be nirvana in terms of synthesizing sounds. For the simple reason that if someone get, gives you a sound and asks you to synthesize it with FM, it's just usually not possible. So what would you do? Well, you would go back and do additive synthesis. It's probably the easiest way to do that kind of thing. Okay, so this now is three operator FM with two of the operators. Sorry, those are oscillators, but we call them operators now because that's what they call them operating on the third one. Right? And now, of course, you can also say, oh, cool. Oh, let me explain quickly again the asymmetry of this design, or of this picture. This oscillator is like these others, except that I haven't thrown this adder in. I'm just saving real estate, because I'm going to, some, if it's going to be a tree structure, for an, it's going to be a tree structure today. And so somebody's going to be on top, someone's going to be out of the leaf. You can't have a tree without leaves, as far as I know. And so this is going to be the leaf. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to say, no, I don't want this thing to modulate this oscillator down here. I want it to modulate this oscillator over here. And then what do you get? Well, you get yet another spectrum. And even less of any reasonable way of describing what that spectrum is, except to say, yeah, except to say this. No, you can't even think about this. Don't even try to put this in your brains. This is a whole other, this is another thing, and you can do it because it's easy to do, but trying to analyze what this does, I think it's just going to be hopeless. So just don't try it. Well, all right, let me tell you how hopeless it is. Analyze these two, and you'll get an infinite number of 
frequencies here, which are this frequency plus or minus multiples of this frequency. Now, this thing then you could regard as equivalent to an additive synthesis network with an infinite number of oscillators in it. Each of those is, is modulating this thing, and I told you how to think about two oscillators mo uh, modulating this thing, which is which gave you a doubly infinite set of peaks. Well, this thing gives you then an infinitely infinite set of peaks because each of these infinite number of peaks is independently, separately modulating this one. And their indices of modulation, furthermore, are given by the amplitudes of the components of this pair, which, which themselves are moving in this horribly complicated way. So the whole thing is just completely beyond uh, any sort of rational analysis at this point. But you can dial it right up on your DX7s, and so you can enjoy it all day. And, you know, people, are, people have gotten good intuitively at making sounds out of this thing, even though it's impossible to understand what's going on. So there is FM operators and um, all that stuff. Now, just to go back quickly to um, the question of... Maybe I don't need this one anymore. Okay. Going back now to this thing, I I said said a rather simple thing about this, which is that the frequencies present are this thing plus or minus integer multiples of this, plus or minus whole number multiples of this, I could even say. All right. Now uh, it turned out that all those things were multiples of one number, which is 110, and you can sort of tell by looking at it that this plus n times that is always, if n's an integer, is always going to be a multiple of 110. That's cool, right? Uh, if I gave you two other, two, well, if I gave you any two numbers here and said, all right, what is a number that this plus or minus n times this is always an integer multiple of? The answer is going to be, unless I'm, mis yeah, I think the answer is always going to be that the best thing that you can get is going to be the greatest common factor of these two numbers. Greatest common denominator, greatest common divisor of these two, the GCD of them, which is in this case 110. But in this case, the greatest common factor of these two numbers is 1. And so th even though it looks nice now, this thing if you want to wait until this thing repeats, you have to wait an entire second because the uh, this thing, well, after a second, this thing will have moved, this thing will have done 551 cycles and this thing will have done 440 cycles and you'll be back where you were. But there's no other point at which these two phases both will be equal to what they were before. And just pushing this index a little bit. Now we can do the usual cheap thrill FM thing, which is walk through all the wonderful frequencies. Oh, should I make this a little louder? A little louder. And if you've ever heard sounds like this, they're not atypical of frequency modulation synthesis. And of course there's the special case where this one and this one happen to be close to integer multiples of something else. So in this case, uh, the what's happening here, we have positive and negative things that didn't quite line up and so they're beating. But this number I believe is about three halves of this number. Is that true? 290, so a half of that is 145, 290 plus yeah. So three halves of this is, I think, 330. Is this possible? 430, 435? Yeah. All right. So now what we have is 150 hertz coming out. Actually, we got odd harmonics again, oddly enough. But, uh, oh. Yeah. So any, So every once in a while, if you sweep either of these two, you'll hit a situation, a sort of syzygy where these peaks whack into each other and, and do something nice and, and 
nice, uh, sparse in terms of spectrum, and then you get those sounds. And between those sounds, you get all of the very juicy, creamy sounds in between. So as you're looking at the spectrum, you can imagine these peaks actually just moving through each other like ghosts through a wall, right? All right, so that, in a nutshell, is the story of frequency modulation. Let's see, what do I have to tell you other than what I've just said that's important? That's what it is. So the things to take home about this are, first off, this is real easy to do, and it's a, it's, it's a cheap thrill. Oh, it's, it's in your cell phone. That's how cheap a thrill it is. And um, what do I mean by that? It's, it, it's so cheap that you can do it in silicon with, uh, using very little, very few watts or microwatts even. And so it, it becomes a very easy thing to build circuits to do. Um, which is why you hear a whole lot of it. It has, it's very well behaved in terms of the amplitudes that you get out because of, of the fact that finally what you're looking at, it, it always ends in this cosine function. So the behavior is good. You, you, you control the amplitude because in, in the end it really is just an oscillator with a changing frequency. Um, the gotcha is that you don't know how to do anything with it uh, other than the very simplest things with any sort of actual predictability. The only way of finding good things out with it, about FM is to develop an intuition about how to get cool things out of FM, which people, of course, have spent many years doing because there are lots of people who spend all their time programming. Not, yeah, literally, there are people who spend all their time programming nice cell phone sounds that sound like trumpets and pianos and uh, bells and all that good stuff. Um, and, and you can enjoy their work, um, and millions of other people can enjoy the work, too. But if you want to do it, you can count on spending many years messing around with these things yourself. And maybe that would be good, and maybe it wouldn't, depending on what you think you want to do with your lives. What else? That's it. That is the entire story of frequency modulation, unless I've forgotten something important. I don't think I have. We're done.